So I'm Tatiana Salisbury. I'm the senior lecturer in global mental health based at King's College London at the Institute of Psychiatry, Psychology and Neuroscience, and also part of the Center for Global Mental Health. Um, I guess my educational background is one that has varied, although mental health has been at the center of it throughout. So as an undergrad, I studied uh, in California, where I'm from, at Stanford University, and I completed uh, a degree in human biology. So that was a mixture of uh, biology, but also thinking about how biological development in humans leads to kind of issues that need to be dealt with within cultures and contexts and societies and how that is done. And I have to say that through that process, I was originally, you know, hoping I was pre-med, so I was hoping to go to medical school. Um, it wasn't until the end, so the last of my four years as an undergraduate, that I realized that what I really liked was this kind of social side um, and how humans adapted and dealt with uh, the kind of issues that came their way. And also I undertook a senior honors thesis, which was a research project um, where I looked at boys' psychosocial development. So it was the relationship between um, ideal masculinity, um, or sorry, ideal muscularity and masculine attitudes amongst high school students. And doing that project made me really um, identify with research and I thought, oh, I'm not going to go to medical school. I'd much rather be a researcher. So I, at the very end of my undergraduate education, decided that I wasn't going to become a, a doctor, much to my mother's disappointment. And uh, <laughs> instead, I moved to Oxford in the UK to study research methods. And I had studied abroad in Oxford as an undergraduate for six months. So I kind of knew the area and uh, really wanted to go back. So I returned uh, to complete a master's in uh, evidence-based social work as it was called then, it isn't now, but I learned how to um, do systematic reviews. So I did a whole <laughs> master's thesis on systematic reviews or in master's um, uh, study and then became a researcher uh, in Oxford. And I worked at the Center for Suicide Research, um, conducting systematic reviews, but also doing a uh, qualitative synthesis of uh, qualitative literature on experiences of emergency departments after people had had a self-harm episode um, and really found that upsetting and uh, very unfair and then kind of went into health services, health service research, uh, and what were ways that we could assess the quality of care that was being provided and also improve that care. So that kind of took me on another kind of bend in the path. And I moved then to London, to University College London, UCL, where I worked on a large European project, an international project across 10 countries, if I remember correctly, in Europe, looking at uh, how we assess quality of care in longer term rehabilitation um, settings. So either based in hospitals or in community based facilities. Uh, and I found that really interesting, I think, because of the differences by country and how some countries with uh, fewer resources were able to do more than other countries and how the, con the, the cultural and contextual issues around, you know, how involved family members are with each other and especially how involved they are in care when someone becomes ill um, plays a role in community integration and the, uh, as a result kind of the prospects for how successfully someone transitions from one of these settings to um, a less uh, intensive, less supportive setting. And so became really interested in that and thought, oh, this is kind of international mental health or global mental health as I thought it was then, um, and found myself then moving to King's where I had a joint um, 
uh, a joint post initially between King's and the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine uh, as part of the Center for Global Mental Health um, nearly 10 years ago now as where I joined as a lecturer uh, and quickly kind of realized that actually the focus was on low and middle income countries and kind of spent a first year just really thinking about what it was that I wanted to do and came to the conclusion that actually child and adolescent mental health was really important for me, especially because at that time there was very little research that wasn't focused on uh, the impact of natural disasters or um, you know, violence or conflict on adolescents and children. And I was particularly interested in just kind of what happens to normal children and how we support their mental health um, as they age. And so got into that, but still very much interested in interventions and health systems uh, and uh, research in that area. So continued with some other projects, but my real kind of passion was in that. Um, submitted a lot of failed research applications, um, got some dubious comments back, as most people um, would also have the experience of. Uh, but I kept fighting and kept saying, eventually someone's going to want to fund what I want to do. Um, and in that time, ended up having two children, so taking two bouts of maternity leave for two years. So I took, I was off two years and a total of probably just under four. Um, and after returning, after my second child uh, was born, I took a step back and I think actually that time away from the research, that time away from kind of reading the journals helped me to kind of think about what was important to me and where I really wanted to contribute. So probably because of a little bit of my own situation um, of just having children and also being an expat, not really having um, much family around. So after I had my second um, maternity leave, I came back and had some time to really think about what was it that I wanted to focus on. And it was still very much around adolescent um, mental health and also thinking about how do you reach, if you're doing mental health promotion and prevention, how are you going to reach the most um, adolescents in a lower middle income country. So typically what's, what's happened is that many of the interventions that are implemented around mental health promotion for young people has been taken from high income countries. And often those settings are within edu the education sector. So what happens in these cases then is that that is just transferred to a lower middle income setting context. And these interventions are then again provided in schools, secondary schools or higher education. However, if you're looking at the proportion of young people that are actually in school in these settings, it's a minority of individuals. So, you know, one could also argue that those young people that are in school might not be as vulnerable as those who are outside of school because. There is money to pay for school. There is, you know, family belief and, 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 and emphasis on education and the importance of that to kind of make a career and, and you know, ha might have impact on livelihoods. Uh, and what are also the situations in which young people might find themselves, which would take them out of school. Um, and that then, if we think about social determinants, might mean that those young people are likely to be more vulnerable to mental health um, issues. So then my kind of focus began, well, how do we then think about reaching those young people? And at that point in time, I was talking to lots of people. So I, I couldn't say this enough, but the importance of going out and telling people what you're thinking, what you're interested in, making those connections, building your networks, I think has been vital for me and, and could be really vital for most people. But just talking to colleagues within uh, the college, I was put in touch with a big maternal health group. And at that exact same time, the Gates Foundation had put out a call for uh, adolescent maternal mental health. So it was you know, a, a really 
timely call and also really timely in terms of where I was in my thinking and what I was hoping to do and kind of fell in with this really wonderful research group and thought, okay, why don't we try to do something um, in uh, Mozambique originally? And alongside this idea of what are we going to do was how are we going to do this? So in looking at the literature after I came back from my maternity leave and, and seeing things, you, know, you could see that there was progress being made um, in terms of the research side. But if you actually looked at practice in these settings, you weren't seeing very much happening. And this was in 2017, so not that long ago, but you know, long enough, lots of things have changed since then. And for me, kind of thinking about, well, what are the, what are the re potential reasons why there hasn't been this connection was this idea that actually one of the reasons potentially is because a lot of these interventions are developed without the kind of high input and partnership with those people who would be the target stakeholders to receive an intervention or those who would you kind of call upon to actually deliver those interventions. And if in any way those interventions weren't attractive or appealing to them and aligned with their thoughts uh, and beliefs that it would have a really hard time taking root within a community. And so I kind of started thinking more along the lines of participatory research and really then was struck when I was doing kind of outside reading about, about this with human-centered design or design thinking and that process of kind of real meaningful engagement um, as a partnership throughout the formative research phases and all the way into kind of testing and, and where we get into um, you know, pilot, uh, pilot uh, evaluations as well as larger trials.